I remember speaking... Yeah, he, he might have this lead, but I remember speaking with somebody from Cane Toad Times many years ago, and they were talking about the Bjorki Peterson era, and I grew up in the... Um, went to uni in the time when, at university, like here, the police would be coming in removing condom vending machines because, heavens forbid, that adults would have sex and protect themselves. They would remove the condom machines. And that was because Joe Bjorki Peterson thought, you know, was offended by the fact that, you know, adults might use condoms. Um, or maybe there was school kids going to university, I don't know. But there was this oppressive nature, and, and somebody was uh, theorising that a lot of that oppression and, and that reflected itself through the arts and through uh, mm. the way we, re- we really were rebelling. And I, th- I felt that too, because when we found, a, you know, what was Gee Whiz back in the 90s, you know, there was that sense of, uh, yeah, the up you, up yours, sticking to the man sort of thing. So I think that, that definitely drove things. People saying you can't do it, you know, I am going to do it. Uh, and that's probably an extension of Aussie culture, but definitely magnified more so, I think, in Queensland based on that, that whole era of being, you know, a police state, as it was in some ways. You have a good these days, kids. <laughs> so I now love how Australian the... When I was talking to the bloke from the Cane Tone Times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was, yeah. Look, see. I was I reflecting was... on Joe, you know. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> was the reality. So, um, now that we've discussed all the terrible things terrible. that terrible. make it awful to design games in Brisbane, but apparently all of these things are our strengths. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. What, what would we like to see? What, what do you think would make developing games in Brisbane better? Do you think that we, you know, is it, is it worth having a look at what Melbourne has in place and would that work here? Um, or should we just continue to just suffer it out? I, th- I think we should dedicate all our resources to building a high-speed train between Noosa and Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only way forward. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We, we, like using the cactus example, um, at the moment we, there's, more, there's space for like more cactuses. But one of the things is there's just so much friction and it's just so difficult that like, you know, that's pretty much you know, like we're a result of how tough the breed has to be to survive but also you know for games to go forward like we really need more different things happening um and you know like like the the roses that are going to sort of pop up in between like i suppose in for the for the long-term health of um games in australia in general and games up here and whatever i think it's just like about trying to continue on this trajectory where we've gone away from the silo thing and everyone is helping each other and you know try and keep that sort of community sort of focus going but also just trying to make it easier and it sounds really silly but I guess that would be in the form of like um people like even we were talking in uh on Monday we were having a bit of a pre-chat about this panel and one of the things that occurred to me is that we pretty much only have commercial games like I've only ever worked on games where I'm trying to make sure that it earns money so we can make the next one um and you know there's some serious games work and stuff going on but I've not sort of ever been in a situation where someone's like, I'm trying to hit this artistic objective and we have this money, can we make that happen? And it's a really interesting thought. And, like, if we've just got cactuses that are just really good at, like, doing what we do, we're never going to kind of explore any of that alternate approaches to the problem. So, yeah, I don't know. I think the problem is that those people with amazing creative ideas that aren't necessarily um, financially responsible maybe don't have the money because there is no way in Queensland that they can get it. At the moment it's a to get money from anywhere you have to better make it back and that's the one difference I think in the building of the community and smaller companies in Victoria. They have been allowed to fail a couple of times with government support um, they've got 80 grand that they never had to pay back to fail and then the next game actually kept them going then for the rest of and they've never had to borrow money again those sort of things we don't actually have the ability at the moment in queensland to apply for funding it's all grants Uh, so yes and no like uh, (laughs) we are so privileged in australia (laughs) we we have it so good the the doll's pretty good there's there's a lot of ways like let's be serious let's stop crying poor because you you really can grab a couple of people sit in a shed and make a game Uh, it's been it's easier now than it has ever been Uh, it is hard for the pros it's hard for people who have like mortgages to pay and, and families to support and and like old people 
definitely need to get their shit in order, <laughs> like, in order to do stuff. But, but the truth is, if you want to make a game, make a game. Like, and make it here, make it there, make it anywhere. Um, can you, you, can, you can do it. And, and there are far less barriers in front of an Australian than an American, where if you happen to trip over on the way to your shed, and, and bust your leg, yeah. you end up, you know, bankrupt for the rest of your life. So it's it's actually, or or heaven forbid, try and do it in India where you can't even get a sandwich. Like, it's there, there is a lot of advantages to doing stuff here. We are, like, right at the top of the, the chain and we're complaining about the gap between, like, 98 and 99%. And I don't think it behooves us well. I, I actually think we are incredibly advantaged. There is a lot to do. I'm very active on trying to push things forward and push the agenda forward for, for Australian game developers broadly and for Brisbane game developers specifically. I think that it is easy to look at Melbourne and see a lot of examples of things that work really well. The arcade model, to answer your initial question, I think there's huge potential for similar things here. But uh, but there's there's opportunities. There's options and opportunities. And, and you can reach markets if you've got something to say. And I think that's that's an important part of our process. I, I just, I, I think that's awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Morgan as well. Like one of the big things when I was making the leap from having a stable wage to maybe no wage at all, I was like, God damn, this is Australia. Like rock bottom ain't that low. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I could go on the door, I could go get a job at McDonald's and damn, I'm still getting like paid way more than most people in the rest of the world. So it's like it's, you're in Australia, it can't go that wrong. Um, so yeah, I absolutely ag- agree with Morgan there. For I was going to yeah. seg out something else, but you guys. No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, and that's uh, <laughs> we, we've we've spent you know the last three years struggling with Ninja Pizza Girl, living off of nothing, and we, we have to have this horrible, horrible lifestyle where we live at the beach and we make video <laughs> games. <laughs> and that, that is rock bottom. We were, we were paying ourselves, like, you know, absolute minimum wage. And we, we did keep thinking, you couldn't do this in the States. You couldn't do this anywhere else in the world because we just, you know, we have a brilliant society with, with support. So, yeah, it's not just students who can do it. It's actually old people who should know better. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to talk to Dan about this, and, and there's re- there's Dan can elaborate, but uh, my feeling is that, you know, with Right Pedal, we had a place at Riverview Labs, and there was, um, you know, we had other people who weren't part of the program would come in and, and work there. So it's not the only work, shared working space in Brisbane, there's others. So there is a chance, you know, you don't have to go to the arcade, and I always think, is it because you've got Pac Man posters on the wall? Does that make it, <laughs> does that make it more of a special place? Um, and I, I think there is places here now you can take advantage of, and I don't, I'm trying to work out what, what it is and what hasn't happened. It's, because River City Labs has a lot to really try and talk about what they've got going there, but maybe we're just not plugged into that network, or maybe we're not hearing it enough. I don't know. I don't think we um, like each other. Though. Maybe that's it. Well, there is there is the advantages of and disadvantages of being somewhere like River City Labs. The disadvantage is you you are surrounded by people who are talking about their exit and you know when they build this infrastructure this technology stack they can sell it to Uber or whatever yeah. but the other advantage is that you are based around people who are thinking that way and saying this is a business so and I found a real advantage I, I got help from things I never thought about there's legal advice and stuff there which is great so there is things there but I don't know what it is I think there might be a I'm trying to work out whether is Melbourne more compact and everyone's closer together or is it is it the I'm trying to work out I'm talking to them about this what, what is the what is it that kind of holds us back a little bit because I think we've got all the elements here I agree. I think one of the important things to look at with Melbourne is that, like, Victoria is literally at the end of 20 years of continuous funding. Yeah. So the, the idea that tomorrow will replicate that is, is just a nonsensical idea, and, and that's not how we should be looking at it. And also, Victoria is probably the best place in the world to make games, like, uh, as a result of that 20 years of funding. I can't think of anywhere else except maybe... The, the Nordic countries where there's that much money rolling into uh, events and um, and you know that's uh, so that's where I think the question of the arcade what is the arcade well the arcade is 20 years of work to, to bring that community together to be working in one space um, and uh, and it, it looks pretty good after 20 years but there's a lot of there's a lot of hard grind along the way so we might just um, open it up to some questions until they throw us out of here so <laughs> Does anyone Can I steal a mic? go for it? Oh, yeah. Oh, Thanks. Okay. Um, since it's 360, why don't we start with you guys asking the audience a question? Do you have any questions for the audience, Morgan? Do, do you hate me because I've had my back to you the whole time? Because <laughs> it feels really weird. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, any questions? 
Don't be shy if it's being filmed. No, I think you should. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, I got a question for Red Shirt. Um, <laughs> for Luke. <laughs> I, I just want to know what it was like. Um, it's like getting your start in like independent phone games. Like since you're big and successful in that. Like I want you to explain what it was like getting into the into phone games. Do you, do you mean like starting pretty great or at half brick? Half brick, please. Oh, okay, right. Sure. Um, Lay it on me. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, it was interesting. Um, so this was, it all happened around the GFC as well. Uh, we'd been doing contracts. We were forced into mobile games in a lot of ways. Like if, we, if there were still easy money contracts on the table, we probably wouldn't have made the leap into mobile. Um, I was literally... Spent, I spent like four or five months just doing pitches for games that weren't going anywhere because there was no investment coming into Australia because the exchange rate and all that. And so then we were like, damn, we got to try something. And luckily, uh, Flight Control had come out. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, my, my friends at the Voxel Agents had made Train Conductor, which had been financially successful for them. So we were straight up just like following those trends. Uh, and so, you know, with that, that really forced us in. It was interesting. I, I made Fruit Ninja based on watching my friends around me, how they interacted with their smartphones, because I didn't have one. I, I still had like a push button dodgy phone. I didn't have an iPhone or a smartphone of any kind. Uh, and so I didn't know what it was like to own one or interact with one. But I used a lot of watching them going like, oh, I guess you guys just do this in the ad breaks. Maybe the games should last about three minutes kind of thing. I, I was kind of inferring a lot of things from that. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting. We, we definitely got forced into it and I was relying a lot on just observing the people around me and not taking anything for granted. Like I literally played zero iPhone games when I started designing Fruit Ninja. I was using a lot of my experience on touch screens from the Nintendo DS, uh, which was a big advantage because touch screens are weird to design for. So I already had a few years up from there. Uh, uh, oh, hello, hello. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, how did you go about marketing your game and like getting it known as like when you were first starting? Like it, it was way easier to like get the <laughs> get it done then because there weren't 6,000 games coming out every week. Um, but right when we did the Fruit Ninja marketing, uh, that was just when like companies like EA and stuff were starting to throw big bucks at, at it. They were like, oh, this, this app store thing, it's the real deal. This is a big market and it's growing. Uh, let's throw money at it. And so there started to be like these incredible, beautiful CGI trailers, sort of like you know, quality of the stuff that's up on the screen. And we had no money. So we were like, okay, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? How are we going to be different from the pack? And so that's why we made like this stupid Fruit Ninja trailer where we had, you know, people we know dress up and I bought $24 worth of fruit, which was, I know exactly how much it cost because that was a big deal. Um, <laughs> I kept that receipt just in case. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we just set out to be different um, and that's sort of how we, we approach the marketing. The problem is now is there is so, like, you know, we did that and then everyone did that because that was path to success and now there is just so much noise and so much signal out there it's really 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 hard like i i really don't know what the definitive answer is um other than building a really really good game and making sure it has really good virality and is perfect in every way and then that'll give you your one in one thousand chance of being successful it's it's ridiculous now <laughs> any other questions Sorry, I'll, I'll come back there. <laughs> Do you guys ever see, I guess, AAA studios coming back to Brisbane or Australia? And would you want it to happen? <laughs> yeah. I hope not. No, it won't happen. Um, it's like a car industry. You know, once it's gone, you, you can't get it back. There's so much. There's so much establishment. Now that said, we've still got an EA studio down in uh, down in Melbourne, which is Fire Monkeys. Um, the there is a possibility if the dollar stays low and the right group 
does it that we could end up with an outsourced studio as part of like an Ubisoft or something like that. But I, I think it's horrendously unlikely, at least in the next few years. Okay. Yeah, I can't add to that. That's yeah. true. The money doesn't make sense, is the upshot. Like, um, it used to be that there was a bunch of skilled people in the West and you wanted English speakers for your outsourced companies, which is part of the reason you end up with Australian companies. Uh, Romania has fantastic studios that are dirt cheap compared to us. Um, uh, there's already well-established studios in Singapore, Shanghai, uh, Beijing. You know, they, if, if what you're looking for is, is a cheaper place to be, the only way it happens is if there's an Australian at Ubisoft who's passionate about coming home yeah. at the, the kind of studio manager level who says, give me a studio. Um, and that's kind of how stuff has happened in the past, but yeah, the, the, the numbers just don't make sense. Okay, next question over here. Uh, yeah, if you guys were to start again now, um, you know, what would be some of the key learnings that you would take if you starting he, up again? He has. Uh, well, yeah, I guess, I guess Luke has, yeah. So I, I don't know if you want yeah, to speak to him. have got somebody here who has. <laughs> well, yeah, what, what would you, uh, well, what are you doing um, that you saw as pitfalls or, or things to try and avoid and, and things to try and do um, that are working well this way around? Sure. Um, I feel like we haven't been running long enough to know whether they've worked. <laughs> I'll tell you what we're, the main things we're trying to do. Um, we're, we're trying to stay small and keep our burn low. Um, you know, we, we got you know, a, a significant amount of money from Matt and Andy, but it is... <laughs> I mean, if I guess if anyone knows this, it's Morgan. Like, man, just run, doing anything just costs a terrifying just amount of money, just and it's money. just like your your bank account just disappears every day. And it doesn't matter like if you guys have the day off, that bank account just keeps draining. And I mean, we're we're trying to stay. You know, at, when I started at Half Brick, there was like twenty people maybe, and and I was there when it grew to a hundred. Um, and I realized that that's not the way I like to work and it brings with it a whole heap of new challenges. Um, I'm definitely trying to stay as small and sustainable as possible, um, giving ourselves the most amount of freedom. But I don't know, we haven't, we haven't been running that long, so who knows? <laughs> did, you, did you have something, maybe? We kind of um, restarted the studio um, about a year and a half ago after about nine months off. So just beforehand, we had uh, got a grant from Screen Australia to do a demo. That demo was going to be our next game. That demo, when then funded out and looked at the budgeting and how long it would take to do what we wanted to do, was about $5 million in four years realistically and then it would have gone over time and over budget <laughs> when we came back we sat down and we said what was it about it what were the things about that game and we made a game as small as damn possible that actually had the things in it that we wanted so like scoping down and we we're we we're on our seventh game and we're still scoping down because every time it's more, it's all, it's about managing the team as well and creative people and getting them to stop working. Well, it's it's good enough, but yeah, for me that was the biggest thing. Anyone who's being encouraged to make an MMO for their first game um, or start a two-year project on their first game, um, which unfortunately some people down in Melbourne are being encouraged to do, and it's scary. Uh, don't do it. Don't, you don't have to make a mobile game. There are heaps of pieces. You know, it's not about choosing a platform that's going to be great. It, you know, PC is still alive, there's, but... There's hundreds of dollars to be made in watch games. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but but, but small. start small. Start small. Yeah, it, it's interesting for me. Like, I've just been having a bit of a spin out thinking about how much the industry's changed since I started with Half Brick in 2001. Mm. And, like, Half Brick had this really good experience in the first sort of couple of months before I joined where there was like a lot of stakeholders and they were trying to make it an Xbox kart racing game and it was most of the same people who'd worked on our uh, like end of year project at at uh, Quantum 
And that was a train wreck of epic proportions. And so then it turns out that the kart racing thing was a train wreck of epic proportions and sort of forced us to like learn a really hard lesson at the start about just making small things that you can do a really good job on. But the, um, the thing that I've just found really interesting thinking about it, and I don't tend to like to bang on about how, how good kids have it nowadays, <laughs> but because the question invited the, uh, the, the point, like it, it's just incredible to me to think how much easier it is nowadays to have a direct relationship with the people playing your games. Mm -hmm. It used to be that like our job was to make games for publishers. So like someone would come to us and go, we need a SpongeBob game for Christmas, which is in five months. Can you do it? And we're like, yes, we need the money. Um, and they're, they're like, oh, it's not actually going to be that much money. It'll be a little bit less. And it's like, okay, I guess we need it. Um, and like you never, you never like had a direct relationship with your customers um, you never knew how many units were sale, uh, sold. They had to put up huge amounts of money to manufacture the carts and have the distribution and all that sort of stuff. It, none of that matters anymore. It's so good. And like you, our, um, we were working on a Game Boy Advance platformer demo for the best part of a year before we convinced John's company to like pay us to make their game using Ty. our demo, Ty. Um, and it took us like a year to make a 2D platformer. And like with Unity, you can basically bang that up in an afternoon. And like this is just the difference of the ease of access of technology. That is incredible. Obviously. Sorry. I thought you did. I can't. Obviously. <laughs> right. Right. Other people who know what they're doing. They, they oh man, you could just buy it off the asset store. You just go. Yeah. yeah. yeah sell it again. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's one of the one of the incredible things is just that um, you know and you know it it's just so easy to sit down and learn Unity and everyone already knows Unity and then you can put it on a platform and the platforms just go to people and you don't have um, like inventory costs or anything, you don't have any of that crap and it's it's incredible. So if I, yeah, the difference between starting now and starting when I started is epic like, and for the better, so much better. My, my biggest piece of advice is ask for help. Mm. Like there's a ton of people, almost everybody around this table will say yes if you say, can I take you to lunch and, and uh, pick your brains. There, there's, there's like, there's not a lot that can be said in five minutes. There's, there's 900 things you, you need to know if you want to start a studio. Um, but you can put your idea in front of Meg and she'll tell you to rescope it. You can, you can sit down and I'll tell you, you know, get somebody who understands numbers early on. You, you don't want your books out of shape. Um, there's there's people who can talk to you about the, the the legal agreements and the setups. There's people who can talk to you about chasing funding in various ways. Like people will have those conversations and generally generously, um, but there is way too much uh, to cover in any in any easy format. But there are people who can help you drill through those. Okay, time for one last question. We're running a bit over time. And then we'll... So earlier in the discussion, you were talking about. Um, uh, immersion of story or the world itself. If you guys just each of the panelists, Lee, if you want to as well, um, just talk about uh, a game that you like uh, purely based on the world or the immersion, not game mechanics or anything, and uh, justification would be awesome. And you can't uh, be biased to anything you've made or any of your co workers or pop <laughs> panelists have made. <laughs> oh man. Because then that would be easy. I, I have a good story about this that um, a couple of years ago, Henry Rollins was coming to town. And he was doing a spoken word thing. And me and two friends were super excited about it. And I'd, I'd taken the job of buying the tickets and just by happenstance had them on me the night when I before when I saw my friends. And I was like, oh, you may as well have your tickets now. And I'll see you at the venue tomorrow. And the next day, I kind of woke up a bit dusty because we were having beers. And um, I was like, oh, have I got anything on today? I do not. I can sit down and I can play Bioshock. And I started playing Bioshock. And... Um, I, I got pretty far in Bioshock. And then at some point I got a phone call from my friends and they're like, hey, what happened to you? I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? And they're like, you missed Henry Rollins. Wow. And they're, they're telling me that after that, there was just this sound of me sighing for about 18 seconds <laughs> uninterrupted. Oh. That I, it had completely skipped my mind. And I was just so blown away by the fact that this game had just drawn me right in and just like destroyed my, my weekend basically, which is fantastic. So I, then I just played more Bioshock, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, 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 no. oh, oh, retrospective, I, I loved, um, I'm going to get the name right, Zelda, A Link Between, no, Link to the Past, the one, the one? The, the, no, no, the one on the GBA, it's mm -hmm. a little black and white one, what's that one, is that Link, oh, the well, one with the, one with the cloudfish, Link's Awakening, Link's Awakening, yeah, and it's weird because when I remember that game, I see it in colour, 
and it's not in colour. And, <laughs> and I imagine it because that was uh, I just got it, like same thing. I got lost in that game, and just the uh, it was a very separate Zelda adventure. The other ones, and it was this whole backstory and stuff I discovered. Yeah, I, I just was totally immersed in that game. That was incredible. Um, just as I said, because whenever I think about it, I I almost see it as a, a DS game in beautiful colour and 3D, and it wasn't at all. Uh, I just it was like reading a book. Loved it. Uh, so is it still going to be about like mechanics and systems because that's <laughs> just how, just how my brain operates? But like um, because they can really create extremely immersive situations. So the game I've been most immersed in ever would be. Deus Ex or Deuce Ex, depending on how you're supposed. And the whole reason is, is like, I mean, you know, it was, you know, has all the story, and at the time it was a very pretty game and all that stuff. But the main thing for me was like, it was the first game I played that had real consequence. It, it mattered when I did things, and it was like that system and uh, that interaction that really drew me in, and yeah, just got me super ultra immersed. For, for me, it's kind of it's a combination of different Ultima games. And in the same way that John talks about, like, remembering black and white mm. things in colour, Ultima Underworld is like a vivid, you know, reenactment of, of, of 3D worlds and amazing, you know, next-gen level graphics in my mind. It's actually like about nine pixels in a square, but you can move in actual 3D. But it comes to those things I talked about. There's a sense of the creator uh, drifting through the cracks of all the Ultima games. Um, you know, not only in that Richard Garriott, who is the lead designer, is in the game as the <laughs> king of, as Lord British King of Britannia, um, who uh, tells you what to do. But uh, you know, the companions you have are people at, uh, on staff who work there. The the three games, um, which is six, seven, and eight, where you're up against the Guardian. The Guardian is EA, like. That whole story is about EA coming in and trashing their company. He has three sigils, which are the three elements of the EA logo as it was back then. Um, and, you know, again, there's something of the creator and the process that drifts through the cracks of, of that game. And it was the first game to do that kind of comprehensive build a big world that I played, where, you know, Ultima 6, you could just wander around and be, poke at stuff and, you know, be like, OK, I'm going to wander off this way and find things in sheds and steal things out of people's houses. And, um, yeah, it really stood out for me at the time. Oh, I got... So this isn't my favourite game, but I have a Bioshock, I guess, story about its immersiveness. I have only ever played in the demo to the moment before you pick up your wrench. That's how good that game was to me at the time. It was, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I get terrified in scary movies, but for me, the immersion of it, and I was sitting in a dark room, I wanted to, wa I, I ended up watching three people play that game because I wanted to play it so much, but couldn't physically continue moving myself through the world. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> So, for that reason, my favourite game is actually my, my the, the world I was most immersed in is a lot has a lot more humour, uh, a lot funnier. It's actually the Fable series. Um, I had there were a lot of games before then that I loved, but for me, that is the only game that I'm not creating my own story in. That uh, yeah, that really 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 brought me in. Uh, I'm going to list a ton because I'm a microphone hog. Uh, You've got ten one. seconds. Oh, damn it! Uh, Labyrinth on the Commodore 64, the video game of the movie. John, have you oh. ever played that? You're probably the only no, greybeard here who would... No, I, I, I struggle to believe that was actually a, a product made by someone. Like, it, it's completely insane and surreal. And I'd seen the movie, so you think, oh, well, it's all spoilers and everything. But the game makes no sense. I couldn't finish the final puzzle, and that haunts me to this day. Uh, I played it when I was 10, and I'm now much older than 10. Uh, Shadow of the Colossus, which I think tells so much with so little. We've, we've all been talking about very wordsy games, but I admire... I'm a very wordsy person myself, so I admire things that, that I can't do. So Shadow of the Colossus. And Journey, which which tells a story even even better with even less. And because I have a personal goal of mentioning it in every single talk that I ever give, I have to say Dark Souls. 
okay. uh, which which is a fairly ordinary game with fairly ordinary and cliche mechanics that we've all seen before, but because of the world and how it was presented, they feel completely new and different and absorbing. Okay, sure. Was that 10 seconds? No. <laughs> it was a kind of 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. uh, so for me, I think um, uh, my horrible addition to gaming probably started really... Uh, with Ultima Online, which I was playing when I was, I think, 15, when I probably wasn't even supposed to be... You had to, like, you know, claim that you're an adult to get into the game at the time. So that was back when, like, Australian internet, I was in Bundaberg, so we had rubbish, rubbish dial-up, and, like, I had every reason to not play Ultima Online because I was not going to be able to do anything and my computer was barely able to run it at the time. But uh, I found a way to enjoy myself around that because... It was social in a way because it was a very early template for MMOs, and it was one of the first um, very you know popular ones because it had that that EA behind it. It had that that franchise. Um, they were really proud of the numbers that they were doing at the time, which was like two hundred thousand uh, subscriptions. Which at the time was like there are two hundred thousand people playing this, and now there's like you know well there used to be twelve million people playing World of Warcraft. So. Um, it was a world that felt big, but was also small enough so that there was uh, within it there was there was a social scene, and I would just hang out. Everyone, the the game was designed around town hubs where people would have to go in order to you know restock after they've been murdered by player killers or whatever else. And so I would just hang out at the bank there uh, with a, a dog that I had trained, because that was like the only thing that wasn't going to kill me was a dog. Um, <laughs> And I had figured out a way of using the in-game chat because when you spoke, your, your, your dialogue appeared above your character's head. So it also, in that way, felt a bit more like you were looking at like a, you know, a, a comic or something. And so people would talk to one another because it was just there. They were, you would see the person in front of you. They would be you know, generally saying awful things because it was the internet. Yeah. <laughs> but still, people were sociable. And so I'd worked out that if you uh, front-loaded your dialogue with uh, just spaces, you could make anything nearby talk. And so I would sit there as people were going around banking, making my dog have conversations either with people or with myself, just to see how long I could keep this up. <laughs> and I was like, that was the only thing I could do because the minute I stepped outside, my 28K mo like modem connection would mean that like 100 people from America would stomp me to death and then like tear my body to pieces and leave it littered around there. But I could still hang out in town just with, with other friends in this, this medieval world talking with my dog. So. Okay, can we all please, I think one of the reasons why Brisbane is still a great place to make games is because you guys have paved such a brilliant way and you're still here. And so let's thank them for being here and talking to us today. Thank you.